Welcome to the Mind Man Podcast, where we don't focus on changing the world. Rather, the focus is on changing the people of the world, because it is the people that create what we call our world. And without changing the minds of the people, there is no hope in changing our world. We are in the midst of a conscious revolution, and it is my intention to raise the collective consciousness And I'm your host, Adrian Moreno. And I thank you in joining me on creating a new world, one mind at a time. All right, let's go ahead and let's dive right in. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Mind Man Podcast. I am extremely excited and I'm, I'm like deeply, um, genuinely pumped up for this, for this interview we have today um, with Ani Manian. This guy, I just, I met him through, um, through my mentor, Sterling Griffin, on a coaching call a few weeks back. And I had to extend, you know, uh, I had to extend my gratitude to him and reach out to him, thanking him for that. And also, I had to get him on this podcast because we spent just one hour with him that day. And um, it, it, I mean, it caused such a shift in me. And I've been practicing what he preached to us on that day. And because I'm seeing like the beauty of it, I just needed to get him on this podcast. And to, for the fact that he can do so much in, in an hour made me, I mean, I just needed to do this. And now, Ani, he is, he, is a, he is a lead advisor for some of the world's most influential entrepreneurs, lead, leaders, and change makers. And I love that he helps them transcend the limitations of their mind. And he helps them see possibilities that weren't once that, that they didn't see, but they've always been there. He's helped dozens of companies grow their revenues all the way from $1 million to $100 million plus. And he's advised over 50 executive teams and he helps them work less while at the same time producing much higher performance, much higher levels of results. And 100% of his clients, now that's one heck of a statement to say, 100% of his clients always see wonderful, profound changes in their life. And um, here we go. We're going to do the exact same thing for you guys. And I just want to say again, Ani, thank you so much. I know you're a busy guy, man, but thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to go ahead and speak with us, brother. It's a pleasure to be with you, Adrian. Absolutely. Same here, man. Now, um, so first off, before we dive in, I just want, you know, I want our, I want our listeners to, you know, just to get to know you, Ani, like, like, what, what do you do? Tell us, t- tell me a bit about yourself, brother. You know, at my core, I'm probably the most obsessive person you'll ever meet in terms of a hunger to really know myself. And I use everything in the world. I use my business. I use my clients. I use my partner. I use my friends, everyone and everything as a reflection to see myself. And it's this relentless pursuit to know myself, to understand myself, to see areas of growth, to see my own patterns, my own tendencies, my own, you know, insecurities, my own beliefs, my own just tapestry of, you know, thoughts that create my identity is actually what gives meaning to my life. And that also happens to be the work that I do professionally. And I'm known by my clients as the ultimate mirror because I help them see what's been hidden from their view that's been in their blind spot that's been wreaking havoc on their business on their relationships on their state of mind things that have been actively keeping them from creating from achieving all that they want to achieve from feeling the well-being that they want to feel and it's usually all these things that we can't see that are almost out of our grasp out of our reach that really affect us the most because it's not really the conscious mind 
that creates results. You know, we consciously dream. We use our conscious mind to think about, you know, we want to grow our business. We want to double it this year. We want to have, you know, the partner of our dreams. We want to have, we want to lose 20 pounds and, you know, put on five pounds of muscle this summer. We make all these dreams. We make all these plans. You know, we start the year out with New Year's resolutions. We start relationships out with this utopian vision for how things are going to be. We start a new diet or a new workout regimen with all these grand, you know, desires and hopes and dreams. But things rarely go according to plan. It's because that conscious mind is only, you know, one to 4% of our to total consciousness. And there's the unconscious mind, which is about 95 to 99%. And there's also the super conscious mind. And we think, you know, we, when we think of our mind, we think that our mind is, it's local to our body. It's in our heads. But, but that's only a small percentage of what we have access to. And I see pretty much, you know, most people make this mistake. They think that the only resources that they have mentally are the things that are in their heads, the things that they know, the skills that they've learned. But that's like thinking like the iPhone is the totality of the Apple iCloud. Mm. The truth is we're all iPhones connected to the iCloud. And when we depend on this local storage, when we depend on just the apps that are installed on our phone, that is, you know, the apps that are installed in our mind, all these programs, then we're really pissing away the larger opportunity. We're disregarding the vast infinite potential that's available to us at any given moment. And we know that, you know, if we want a new app, we can just go to the app store. If we want a new song, a new album, a new genre of music, we can just open iTunes. We know that if we want more storage, we can just buy more storage with iCloud and, you know, we don't have to be limited to 128, you know, gigabytes or 256 that the phone comes installed with. We know intuitively with our phones that this isn't the whole picture. You know, this is just what I need right now. But we don't, we don't really feel connected to that truth with our minds, with ourselves. And that's why we live these limited lives. We live these limited lives because everything in our local storage is a kind of limitation. Because everything in our mind operates in the form of beliefs. And pretty much every belief is a limiting belief. A belief says that you know, my third grade teacher said that, you know, I, I bombed a, a math test. So, you know, I suck at math. And that belief forms because she did that in front of the whole class and everyone laughed at me. And now because our brain is particularly more plastic when there's a high emotional experience associated to the experience. Um, now I've, I've, sort of created these, this belief that I suck at math. Now, because I have this belief, the next time there's a math test, I'm going to start feeling some anxiety leading up to it. And because I'm starting to feel anxiety leading up to it, I'm not really going to be present and I'm not really going to enjoy the process of studying for that test. And because I'm now afraid of it, now because I'm trying to avoid the pain that I know is going to come like it did last time, I start pulling away from it. And now because I'm pulling away from it, the brain um, and the mind work together to create these synapses and these stories that math is painful. I'm not good at math. And, you know, math brings me pain and shame and guilt. And so now I'm starting to develop this relationship with math. I'm starting to wire in these neural connections about math. And the story that I'm not good at math protects me. It protects my fragile self-esteem. Now, 10 years down the line, what happens is all the choices I make 
or informed based on this belief. You know, maybe I'm actually great at math and maybe I could have been an astrophysicist and, you know, done all these cool things that I wanted to do, but to protect my fragile ego, I don't do those things. Maybe I become a fashion designer, right? Or maybe I become, um, you know, something else that is as far away from that pain as possible because we spend our entire life trying to avoid pain and seek pleasure. So pretty much everything is mind, right? Every, every object that's man-made in the world was created out of the mind. Everything starts with the mind. And it's the most important variable for any human being, whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you're a leader influencing you know, your employees, whether you're a change maker, an impact maker, influencing millions of people and leading movements, whether you know, you're just a stay-at-home mom leading a family, <laughs> you know, whether you're a doctor, whether you're a lawyer, whether you're a 16-year-old angsty teenager who's having all this stuff that feels too much. Every single human being finds make or break based on their mental experience of life because that's where we experience life. That's where life is experienced. That is where we experience ourselves. And our experience of ourselves happens through our thinking. And our thinking is scaffolded based on our beliefs. And these beliefs are formed when we're kids, when we're really young. Actually, by the age of seven, 95% of our beliefs are pretty much established and everything else beyond then is just playing off the tape recorder over and over again. That is so crazy. That's why you see these patterns in people, right? You see people, you know, going from abusive relationship to abusive relationship. You see people who, you know, if they have a pattern of getting fired from jobs, that becomes their story. And you see it the other way around too. You see people who, you know, are always lucky, right? They always somehow make it work and somehow they always end up on top, right? It goes both ways. Mm. And that's the law of inertia. You know, it's easier to continue that momentum, whether that's upward momentum or downward. So when we wake up, in the morning and something like not so great happens sometimes it tanks the entire day right yeah. we, we let like a one minute experience tank the entire day and this is very true particularly in fitness and nutrition like one bad choice essentially creates this shame or guilt spiral and then it's like well what's the point now so my whole day is gone Right, I keep making poor choices. Might as well just screw up my diet all day. Exactly, exactly. And we do this at a micro level, we do this at a macro level, and we do this at every level in between. Because no one told us, no one taught us, no one showed us how to use our minds. People are told what to think, not how to think. And that's the greatest failing of this education system. Right, This is a series of systematic indoctrinations, whether you think about the military, you think about conventional schooling, you think about university, you think about, you know, working a job, everything is indoctrination. Every, there's beliefs being installed. That's what parenting is these days. Right? Don't talk to strangers. Sure, a lot of these things sometimes on the surface seem to serve a purpose, but what you're also wiring into your kid is less sociability, right? And there's that balance. What's our responsibility to each other? What's our responsibility to ourselves? And I believe the first responsibility is don't believe a single thing you think. <laughs> don't believe a <laughs> single do thought you think because it's all made up. It's all a projection. It's all a function of, you know, your experiences and how you interpreted those, those experiences. And now you've, you know, we're quick to believe what we think <laughs> because it came up in my head. It means it's true, right? And now I take that and I have arguments with people on Facebook, right? And we go like 60 comments deep and now it's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a pissing match. And we see this all day, right? We all see this day everywhere. Long. 
the attachment. That's all ego, right? Being attached to the ego is a great way to detach from happiness, from your dreams, from everything you could possibly want, right? The ego is not the enemy, though. That's the thing. The ego is not the enemy. The ego is actually serving a purpose. It's there to protect us. Yeah. Right? It's, it's there for us. So the goal is not to kill the ego. A lot of people say you need to kill the ego. You got to kill the ego. Mm-hmm. You got to defeat the ego. When you do battle with your ego, it's going to be ugly. Because the ego is a part of you. So what you're really saying is you want to kill a part of yourself, right? You wouldn't chop your arm off. So why would you try and kill your ego? <laughs> Man, that makes sense. Cause yeah. And I, all of this is, you know, fundamental misunderstanding. Yeah. It's at a fundamental basis and no, that that's a hundred percent true. And let me, let me ask you, when did, were you like, always like you said like you've been obsessed with finding finding out yourself finding out who you are like did you have an awakening or like was it like a gradual thing like since you were young you always knew there was something more or did you experience you know like what people call you know like a spiritual awakening like what was it that turned you in this direction of life yeah i think my whole life i've been more curious than the average bear about the human experience, (laughs) Mm. right? And initially it's because it was a survival mechanism. You know, when I was a kid, I grew up super poor. We moved around a lot every six months. I kept changing schools, had to make new friends, had to really recreate an equilibrium wherever I went. And I had to learn. I had to learn how to you know, really feel people, really know people, right? I had to know how to create rapport. <laughs> I had to know how to create rapport quickly with someone new. And so since I was a kid, I had to learn to understand people and see people and, and, and really understand those dynamics that are at play in human interaction, you know, in in the human experience, in the human dimension. And, you know, that's always been a part of my life. And if there was a moment that I can um, pick out and label it as a kind of an awakening, and I, and I you know, hesitate to pick one moment, but this one I'll, I'll share because... You know, most people think that awakening happens in an instant and then everything is illuminated and then everything's different. And then, you know, we see all the, all the Zen fairy tales of enlightenment, but it's rarely like that, right? Those, those moments don't really stick. That's why people have, you know, experiences like that. And then they come, they bounce back. It's like a rubber band. They snap back to their regular life. And it actually takes a series of those moments, a series of awakenings to actually crystallize into a new normal. And so, you know, one of the pivotal moments for me was actually seeing my dad die because A, he didn't love himself enough and B, because he didn't have a context for his own experience. He didn't have the tools to be with his own emotions and i saw firsthand what happens when a human being and this was a human being very close to me is fundamentally challenged in in being with themselves in being with their experience and all the ways in which we deflect we avoid we numb we compensate we project any You know, growing up, I saw him do everything. I mean, whether it was workaholism, alcoholism, food, um, there's so much that we do to avoid feeling what wants to be felt within us. And so in a way, my whole life was 
my education for the, the work I do now, right? And cremating his dead body, and he was only like 66 when he passed away. Okay. It was like, it was exquisitely painful. And it opened up this, this world where I realized what was actually meaningful. You know, I'd had a very successful career up until then, like helping businesses grow and scale and, you know, leading industries and, you know, advising Fortune 500 CEOs and executives. It's, but everything felt completely meaningless because I saw my dad, regardless of, you know, how much success he'd achieved, no matter what he'd created for himself and, you know, what he'd created for everyone in his life and his family, none of it was important because deep down, he couldn't fully re receive the gifts that he'd worked so hard for. And because of that, he didn't choose to give himself the, you know, the medical attention he needed and he dismissed his own needs. And, you know, the, the liver cirrhosis that he developed kept getting worse and worse and worse until he was gone. And so that moment really sort of ripped my world open. And I realized that, you know, the rest of my life had to be spent awakening people, not just to their true potential, but to their true experience. Because what we can create in this world for ourselves, how much happiness we can have, what we can, you know, what kind of impact we can make in the world, it's directly proportional to how much of our own experience we can tolerate and what's happening in the world right now right we see this race war and it's brewing you know this is the same thing the fact of the matter is we have a profound inability not because of any fault of our own we just you know we're not taught this stuff yeah right we're taught the exact opposite and we're not modeled this stuff or what's modeled is the exact opposite. We're not intimate with our own experience. So when we see a conditioned response, which is what a cop has to a person of color, there is no, the window of tolerance for that is so small that there's an immediate conditioned reaction. And you know, there's a complete dissociation. Because when you're literally suffocating and choking another human being to death, you like it's highly unlikely that the person's highly associated into the experience. They're gone, right? They're playing out a pattern. And that pattern's been installed by society. That's been installed by culture. That's been installed by history. And so this is really at the core of pretty much everything, right? Everything from making more money, growing a business, having a great relationship, like just being happier, having a peaceful experience of life, like ending, you know, racism, ending classism, ending sexism, having more inclusion for people of color, like, you know, gay, trans, LGP, like literally every yeah. problem in the world originates because we aren't intimate with our own experience. And so the, my, the purpose of my life is to really make a dent as much as I can in helping people really be with themselves and be with each other. Because when we can do that, then the possibilities are endless, right? All our limits begin in our mind and they end in our mind. And that's the limit to which we can tolerate our own experience. I've never looked at it like that. That's all. I, I like that a lot. And I, I mean, in all, in all honesty, I feel like there is a part of me that I'm not you know, fully experiencing or I'm putting off because I'm at a phase of life, like in business, if I'm being a hundred percent honest, like I'm, I'm in that like speed. I'm in that phase of 
Like, I really need to go. I really need to go. I really need to go. But I find myself, but I, I really do feel uneasy about it. Like, it, like, cause I find myself compromising sometimes my meditations and my writings because I got something to do right now. And I feel like a pull because I, I try to justify it by telling myself, Adrian, you're young. You came from nothing. Your family needs to be taken care of. And so you really need to take advantage of the energy you have right now and take care of them financially. And so I see myself just, I just want to one day throw a financial blanket over my family, make sure they're good. And so I see myself in a phase of like, I need to go, go, go. But then there's a part of me that's saying like, Adrian, you need to, like, you're missing out on a lot. You're missing, you're not seeing your family. You're not like, you got to like really slow down. And I just don't know how to, I don't, I don't know what to listen to. Like, I feel like I'm pulled in two, two different directions. So um, I guess what I'm asking you is how do you be with that? Like, how do you be with yourself and face that? Yeah. So here's the thing, you know, this is a lot of my work deals with these cases of mistaken identities, <laughs> right? And this is another classic case where it really looks like if you sped up, then you would be more successful and you would make more money, right? That's what it looks like. I it really, yeah, it really looks like that, right? And it really looks like if you slow down and instead of meditating for 10 minutes, you meditate for 30 minutes, you'd be taking away from that success bucket, right? And from that wealth bucket. And, you know, you would be letting people down because you're not doing as much as you can right now as long as that's what looks real your actions make perfect sense right i mean it makes perfect sense this way of thinking and in fact over the next month if you basically cut out all the meditation you cut out all the self care you cut off you know taking an extra 1 minute in the shower to breathe you cut out all those things. You cut out those random phone calls to friends. You cut out, you know, the FaceTimes with grandmother. Like, it would make perfect sense because you'd be doing more of what helps you create the wealth and success and less of the stuff that just distracts you, correct? Mm -hmm. But deep down, intuitively, you know. I know. You know that those things that, pretty much everyone says aren't direct correlates for success and wealth contribute in some way, right? What if it, they weren't just the, um, the sprinkles on top, but they were the actual ice cream? And what if the linear hustle and work and, you know, go, 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 was the sprinkle on top? Because here's the thing. Most people spend their entire life in the go, 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 only to realize that they climbed the wrong mountain. Man. And there's nothing more tragic than that flavor of regret. Because life is about constantly adjusting, right? Because this is a video game that we're playing. And in this video game, you know, we got to keep scanning. We got to keep looking. We got to keep thinking, keep reflecting, keep checking in with ourselves. Like, is this what I want? And do I feel aligned? Is this meeting, you know? So that's one perspective I want to offer you. The other one is that when we play this game of, you know, hustle or you know, self-care and meditation and reflection and slowing down, right? When we play this um, binary game of slowing down, speeding up, think about when we use that, that concept of slowing down and speeding up with a car, right? Or with a bike. Mm -hmm. And it's usually when we're trying to get somewhere, right? We're at point A, we want to get to B, 
you're in Austin, you want to get to San Antonio or wherever you might be, right? Based on where you're listening from. Now, in a car, that makes total sense. That if you press the gas pedal, if you speed up, then you'll get there faster, right? And if you release the gas pedal a little bit and you slow down, then it'll take you more time to get there. Fair? Yeah. So the origin of the metaphor is that when we are trying to get from point A to point B, slowing down slows things down and speeding up, pressing the gas pedal gets us there faster. And it's tempting to apply that to business or work or even fitness, right? And it's tempting to think that, you know, if I just press on the gas pedal, if I just work 10 hours a day instead of eight, then I'll get there quicker. But what if it wasn't so linear? What if that was not the difference that made the difference? What if human beings weren't cars? We're not. And when we treated ourselves like cars, because if you're a car and you're trying to get from point A to point B, until you get to point B, you're hyper aware that you're not at point B, right? Yes. Which means if you treat yourself like a car, then until you get to that, whatever the definition of success is, you're going to be acutely aware every minute of every day that you're not there, which means you're going to be in lack, which means you're going to be telling yourself, I'm not there yet, I'm not there yet, I'm not there yet, which means you're not going to be able to enjoy the journey. And if you're not enjoying the journey, you're probably beating yourself up a bit for not being there yet. Now, I'm yet to find a single human being who performs better when they're beating themselves up. Like not one human being in the history of mankind actually did better. They had better ideas. They were more creative. They were more present. They were more engaged. They, they utilized more of their potential. And they were in flow because they were whipping themselves literally constantly, not there yet, not there yet, not there yet, speed up, speed up, speed up. But I know plenty of people that when they give themselves space, when they remove that pressure, when they remove that punishing guilt and shame, and they let go of the whip, they realize that they kind of know what to do. Like they know what they need to do. And they allow themselves to do it really well. And they have a lot of fun doing it. And if there's one thing I know to be true, is that when we are having genuine fun and are joyful doing something, then we just do it really well. And when we do things really well, the success and the wealth and everything that we seek is absolutely inevitable. Very true. So, so let's say, okay, so let's say there's somebody, I'm not going to say his name, there's somebody who's working like 100 hours a week, all right? They're working 100 okay. hours a week. They're completely burnt out week after week, but they're constantly pushing. And their business, let's say it's been stuck at 70 grand a month, right? Just stuck at 70 grand a month for the last few months and hasn't been able to break that. And they have a goal of breaking past 100 grand a month. What advice would you give them in terms of taking their next steps to break that boundary, to break that? So... The first thing I would say is that they're full of shit. Because this goal of going from 70 to 100K a month is completely arbitrary. And when we chase arbitrary goals, it's 
really annoying. We make it really hard on ourselves. We feel really uninspired. And we think just doing more will lead to us making more. Because at that level, it's actually about doing less. So I specialize in exponential business growth. And pretty much every single client I have, and these are, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten figure entrepreneurs, every single time that the company makes an exponential leap in revenue, it's because the CEO, the 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 person running the company figured out how to do less and how to decouple themselves from their company. Because as long as you are relying on your company for meeting your foundational needs, whether it's approval, whether it's control, whether it's security, whatever it may be, validation, you're going to make yourself a bottleneck. And as long as you're a bottleneck, like in your company, your company isn't going to be able to grow more than you are able to grow because there's a natural cap on how much time you have, how much energy you have, and how much capacity you have as a human being. If you want your company to grow past those caps, those ceilings, you have to separate yourself from your company. To separate yourself from your company, you need to do less and you need to let either systems or your employees do more because those things scale. People don't scale as in founders don't scale. Right. Yeah. So first off, you know, the goal is completely backwards. That's a wrong way to look at it because when we say we want to go from 70 to hundred, we immediately think about, okay, so what more can I do? to make that happen, right? So in these cases, what I do is I, I, I rip the business to shreds, right? And we rebuild a business based on the spec of what we're trying to create. It's like, you know, imagine you have a house, right? And you decide that you want to add two floors to the house. But the original foundation of the house and the original like structure of the house wasn't designed to support two additional floors, right? So this idea of going from 70 to 100 or even 200 is really saying, okay, let me just figure out how to add two floors. I'll you know, do whatever it takes. I'll add some more beams. I'll add some more pillars around and I'll cantilever something and I'll you know, Frankenstein it together right? But when you do that, likely you're not going to be very pleased with the result. It's not going to look very pretty. It's not going to be as enjoyable. So it's far easier to actually build the house you want to live in, build your dream house. And a business is like a house, right? We can either build a business by figuring it out, or we can come up with the right blueprints to build the business that fits the entrepreneur like a glove, which means mm. I'm, I only work three days a week. I um, you know, work three weeks a month and I take a week off every month to hang with my mom. I you know, always leave weekends open to meet my friends. Like Very few entrepreneurs actually build a business by design. Right Now imagine building a house that way that, you know, I don't have any idea what this house needs to look like. I don't have any idea how much load it needs to support, how many rooms. I'm just going to start building and I'm going to just see what happens. But that's what most entrepreneurs do. Then they get to some level of success where they're like, okay, I'm, I'm at 50K a month. I'm at 100K a month. I'm at 200K a month. And I want to go up to this level. And it's like, okay, I sort of, you know, Without a real design, I sort of got this far. Now I want to keep doing what I've been doing. And that just compounds the problem. This is why entrepreneurs get trapped in their businesses. They become slaves to their own businesses and they feel stuck. 
And this is when usually resentment starts to develop because now your business is competing with your family. Your business is competing with your friends. Mm. Your business is competing with your hobbies. And usually what happens, and I see this more with male entrepreneurs, male clients and female, the business takes precedence. When the business takes precedence, we start dissociating from all those things. We start doing fewer of the things that made us happy. We start hanging, we, we don't hang out as much with you know, friends and family who help us relax and disconnect and recharge, which means we're always working, we're always stressed, we're always in a high sympathetic charge, and we're always anxious, always overwhelmed, which means our actual net productivity is much lower. And we think we need to keep up this farce and we end up in a hamster wheel. And the only way to come out of this is to actually sketch out the plans for the business that will meet all your needs, right? Which almost no one does. Like how many entrepreneurs have thought about what is my ideal lifestyle? How much do I want to work? What are my values? How much time do I want to have for myself? How much time, like when do I want to work out? Like I plan my business based on my needs, which means the first thing that goes on my calendar is when I work out, when I spend time in nature, when I spend time with my partner, my business comes after that. Most entrepreneurs, their employees and their clients and their business has access to their time first. And then they take the scraps and their families get you know whatever little is left over which is a great recipe to be pissed off and miserable and when we're pissed off and miserable we're not going to be as successful and as wealthy and as powerful and as impactful as we want to be the whole like by design you know like what do you what kind of life do you want building it based off of my life rather than numbers and the right right like I never thought about it like that. Wow. That was just like an epiphany right there. And then figuring out the systems to fix that, to fit that. Man, I like that. And, and so one of the, one question that I, because um, um, a lot of the life changers and, you know, life changer Academy, they were very, like when I told them I was doing this podcast, a few of them, um, they said like, I have a question that I want to ask them. And then one of the questions were, um, she goes, she said, he made made it seem so simple to just not worry, not be stressed, but how do you properly run your business without doing the things you don't enjoy and with lots of structure? I feel like you kind of just answered that in all honesty, but do you have anything you want to add to that question? Yeah. So, you know, the thing is, we've all been brainwashed into thinking that worry, anxiety, stress is a precondition for success. Like We've told ourselves that like, I need to do shit that I don't like. I need to be miserable because that's what it's going to take. So when I already, when I decide that that's how it's going to be, then do you think, is there, is there any room you think for things to not be like that? No, I mean, you're the one who's putting, that's your story. Exactly. So most entrepreneurs believe that the worry, the stress, the structure, the doing stuff that they don't want to do, being miserable is a foundational contribution they need to make. It's like the suffering they need to sign up for to be successful. And as long as they believe that, that's how it's going to be, right? So what I do with my clients is that I show them, A, that A, that's not true, right? They see it. They see that, oh, wow. I had accepted this because I learned this from my dad. I learned this from, you know, the people around me. It's another case of mistaken identity, right? where if that's what I believe is needed for success, you, you bet that I'm going to stress myself out, make myself anxious and like really suffer because I believe that if I do that, then I'm going to be successful. The more stuff I do that I don't want to do, the closer I am to all my dreams coming true. 
Well, what if that was not true? What if it could actually be easy? But the thing is, you won't find out until you ask the question. Right? And most people, they don't dare ask that question. Because most people are trying to earn their self-worth with their businesses. Most people justify the money they make with the amount of suffering that they take. That's very true. Very true in the business world. And how do you, like what, like, cause like also on your end, you like said it a couple of times about, you know, you help those entrepreneurs in those companies, you know, like create space. And on your website, it says, you know, like I help people create a space where miracles can happen. Like what, what is that space? And like, how do we create it? The foundational catalyst for change for any human being is insight. What insight is, is to have sight within. It's to be able to see ourselves, right? And when we really see what we're doing, and how it's affecting us and when we see that there's another option then things just click it's like a, a, a good way to think about this is imagine you're at a bar right and you're you head to the bathroom right and there's one of those uh, doors with a handle and it says pull right and so you pull and it opens. And now imagine that someone messed up the signs and the door, you know, the, the label was push rather than pull. And now you're pushing, 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 pushing. The door doesn't open and you're getting frustrated. So you push more and you're getting really aggravated. You keep, you keep pushing, you shoulder check the door, trying to get it to open. Nothing works. Now imagine you know, someone who works there sees you do this and they just come over and they grab the handle and they pull and the door opens. And you see in that second that, oh, this is a pull door. It's not a push door, right? Now, that changes everything. So that's what it's like because when we see what we're doing, when we see what's actually happening and what's behind the decisions we make, the tendencies we have, the choices, the reactions, it changes everything. Like one of my clients, this is recent, this is like last week, is a, he is in the process of selling his company for I think $5 million. And you know, a lot of our work was around the negotiation of the sale. And we uncovered that he'd had a fundamental uh, discomfort with speaking his needs, which means in the beginning of the negotiations, he basically was willing to take, you know, I think like 3 million or 3.2. And there were all these covenants that the acquirers wanted to put on it and he'd signed up for it. And we basically systematically dismantled all of those things and forced a revaluation. And now he is about to close the deal for five, right? Now, all of that comes down to one singular insight, which is he saw that he has a history of not speaking up for his needs and not setting boundaries, right? And he's, he, he's been doing that his whole life. This is a very successful entrepreneur, very respected leader. He's been doing that his whole life because he thought that that's what he had to do. That that's all he would get. Right? But when he sees that that's not the case, it opens up a little bit of space for, for him to take a different action, to make a different choice. Mm. He showed up to that negotiation and he said, you know, 
I know we've been going in this direction, but things have changed on our end. And these are the terms of the, of the deal we're willing to offer. And he didn't budge. And to his surprise, it didn't, it, I think they were on the, on the call for about two hours, but two hours for $2 million is not a bad deal. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> right. And he just held his ground because he saw, he saw the option. And that's the thing for most of us. The reason why we settle for much less is because we don't see another option. We don't see an option to, to have a very successful, lucrative business without the stress. We don't see that option. So we, we never experience that without stress, right? If I think that the door is a push door, right? When it's actually a pull door and the pull option that just doesn't exist, I'm going to be really frustrated. But as soon as I see it, everything changes. There's more space, there's more choice, there's more options, there's more ease. I don't have to battle a door every time I want to use the restroom. I think the fundamental understanding that there's always another option. Always. Exactly, exactly. That is, that's beautiful. I, I mean, I gotta say, man, I've, I've another hour with you <laughs> and I'm already like, I, I, I've realized like when you just said that he was never comfortable speaking his needs, I kind of feel that way with my business, you know, like I feel like, Hey man, I got to put my business before me at this time of my life because I'm young and um, all the entrepreneurs that I know, they say, Hey, you're young. Um, you got to you got to do all the things you don't want. So you can do all the things you do want. You got to work a hundred hours a week. You got to do all of this. You got to do all of this. And um, I'm just realizing I didn't, I never created another option for myself. And I never even asked to ask, you know, can this be easier? So that's a great thing for you to reflect on, which is what if this was easy? Like, what would this business look like if it was easy? Forget the money. Yeah. Right, the money will come guaranteed always. But if you answer that question, if you really answer that question, what would this look like if it was easy? How much would I work? What would I be doing when I did work? Who would I be working with? How would I be marketing? What kind of programs would I offer? Like when you sketch that out you may end up with a completely different business and that's good because when, because when you end up with a, with a design for a business that feels easy, you'll be so much more successful yeah. because this is what I do, right? Who, what I do in my business is an extension of who I am. This doesn't take effort for me. I can tell. Right? So this is a place of zero effort. And when I can work in a place of zero effort, then A, no one can outcompete me. And I can live and work in a state of flow because there's no resistance. Like I don't need to manufacture energy to do what I do. Yeah. It just happens. Right. And that's the goal. That's the, that's how we get to unlimited upside. Unlimited upside. Cause that's all it feels like. Exactly. And you get, you're getting paid for, for doing something that you love, feeling great, feeling really happy and just being peaceful and chill. And that is actually the problem for most people. They feel guilty They're deep, about that. Yes. And they can't be with the guilt. So they work. Oh my God. That is so me. That is so me. I don't even like taking a day off because I just feel like, I'm like, dude, you gotta, I, I gotta right. bring my computer with me somewhere. There you go. There you oh go. Oh my God. So I gotta just be with that guilt. 
Yep. You gotta love the shit out of that girl. Love the shit out of it. Oh my god, this is like. I got so much from this, man. I can't even explain to you what this is about to do. Like, I can imagine, like, if I'm, there's been things that I wanted to do that don't relate to my health and fitness business. And now I'm realizing that I can create that. And it only makes sense to create that now. Thank you. That was, this was huge for me. This was huge for me. So before I let you go, another, just one last question is, who would you say all of us are at our core? Pure potential. Pure potential. That's why I believe that we are all limitless. We're all infinite, pure potential. All the limitations we face and see are created in our own minds. And that's my specialty. I help people be limitless because if they were created in our minds, we can uncreate them. No, no. When we uncreate, when we dissolve those limitations, then we're infinite, pure potential. We can create anything. We can impact a billion lives. You know, we can be beautiful. extraordinarily happy. We can have the body we want, the life we want you know, the, the community we want, we can have anything we want. We just need to be ready to have it. Allow yourself to have exactly. it. Exactly. Uh, beautiful, man. Well, I mean, I just want to say, you know, thanks a lot for this. And if you had 30 seconds left to live, you, you, you knew you were going to be out in, in less than a minute. In less than a minute, what would be, what would you leave? in the world what would the last thing you tell the people who are listening to you if that's all you had left not business related and just overall in general if you want ultimate freedom and ultimate happiness and joy and well-being just learn to love yourself and accept yourself unconditionally that's the secret to life. That's the secret to life. There you heard the secret to life right here on the Mind Man podcast with my man, Ani. Brother, thank you again um, so much. This has been an extremely wonderful time. So if, if, you know, if, if our listeners are drawn to you and they want to like, you know, be involved in your world or they want to get to know you more, where would they contact you? How are they being involved with your work and stuff like that? Where can we yeah, you can, you can find me at animanian.com, A-N-I-M-A-N-I-A-N.com or on Instagram at ani.manian. And um, I also just started a new company with my partner called Untamed Intimacy. So find us at, at Untamed Intimacy on, uh, or it's actually Untamed underscore Intimacy on uh, Instagram. Okay. We're going to be helping uh, bring this work to couples and Oh, and awesome. help them build relationship intimacy because I think that's another thing that's, you know, we really believe that the next generation, for the next generation to be truly equipped to create the social change that we want, the people who are in relationship right now need to know how to be intimate with themselves and with each other. And we're seeing so many of our personal problems being projected into relationships. So another big mission that we've just kicked off is to, help bring a sense of wild, passionate, safe, trusting kind of intimacy as a new standard for how we relate to each other, not just romantically, but just as people with our you know, friends, with our family, with each other, with uh, our employees, with our clients, because every human being needs this. Every human being has a basic need for intimacy, for connection, for safety for trust and it's about time that someone did something about it so yeah i will come find us come uh come join us we're uh yeah, definitely we no, lead a a podcast. yes uh the podcast called you are limitless and you can find it on all the all the channels and uh yeah it's uh 
it's been a real pleasure to have this conversation with you, brother. It has. It, it truly has. And I love the direction it took naturally. And I'm happy that we got a chance to connect again, brother. But again, thank you so much for your time. And, um, you know, I got great love for you, man. Infinitely, you have made a real impact on my life with our short time together. And um, I look forward to connecting more in the future, man. And uh, yeah, brother, thank you so much again. Such a pleasure, man. Absolutely, brother. Have a good one. You too.